Good morning, and thank you, uh, John, for the uh, warm introductions. And uh, I am with uh, Kiewit Corporation, named Randy Denninger. I'm not sure where John got the Kiewit International from. That's not a real thing. But Kiewit or Kiewit Corporation uh, is, it will work. And I've, I've been our, um, also a member of the PEG for the last six of those seven years with Kiewit. Uh, the PEG is a procurement executive group for the engineering and construction industry. And um, we'll be presenting to Break Bulk again today. It's been a few years since we've been here, so we're very pleased uh, that John Amos invited us back. It was a big hit a few years ago. Also presenting uh, our other uh, panelists here, we've got Kent Danforth from SNB, we've got Jay Pendergrass from Floor, and Carl Newton from Wood. And our discussion topics today. So uh, Kent is going to start out with a PEG overview little bit of the history of the PEG and what it is. And then we'll get into some selected market sector updates and Carl is gonna talk about renewable energy. And I'll follow that up with uh, some of the uh, industrial projects and really the demand drivers for a lot of the uh, new projects that the EPCs are seeing in the future. And then uh, Jay is gonna finish that with um, an IHS global economic uh, outlook and then we'll do some Q&A. Well, good morning everybody. Uh, I'm not from Milwaukee, uh, Randy's got that one covered. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not a native Houstonian, which is just fine. Uh, it was really interesting to see the group that's here today. We have a lot of logistics folks, and uh, as we know in, in our industry, in the procurement side is where our logistics usually sit. So when, when people talk about the uh, engineering and construction side of the business, well, don't forget, we all do a lot of EPC work, and that P stands for? procurement. So uh, I never lose sight of that and usually every staff meeting I, I mention it. Uh, the PEG group is a procurement executive group. They uh, got me in this group about four years ago. I thought it was procurement excellence group. I, I learned that's not what it stands for. It's an executive group of a lot of different companies across the country. Uh, we're actually looking to, to maybe stretch ourselves international going forward. Uh, and as you can see in the slides, it, it's just a forum for us to talk about any of the issues we have. It's a lot of your vice presidents of procurement, senior vice presidents, directors, people that, uh, that run different procurement groups at different companies. What we try to do is we always try to have membership, meaning if uh, Randy can't make it or Carl can't make it, they'll send a representative so that we can, we can figure out what we want to talk about and, and get some of the issues out. As you can see, we were founded in 1994. I uh, was seven member firms and uh, 16 members. And I think right now we're at 16 different groups uh, that uh, are part of the PEG, different companies that send reps. We have two annual meetings. Sometimes we have anywhere from uh, 20 to 25 people in these meetings. And uh, some of you, I'm looking out, uh, I haven't seen Grant in eight years. I saw him twice this week. Uh, he was at our PEG group. But uh, we have a lot of guest speakers. And uh, we, we, we try to get to the issues. Some of the things that we have to talk about is, uh, you'll see the nasty words up there, that's the legal side, is the strict antitrust compliance. Long story short, we don't give away state, state secrets from our companies amongst each other. We don't talk about bids, we don't talk about vendors, we, we talk about issues. So we all sign up to that, and we make sure that everybody has a firm understanding of what we're there to do basically learn from each other. And uh, when we're done, uh, not, to, not to belabor it, but when we're done, I want, I want some questions. We, we need questions from the panel out here for you guys to beat us up. All the tough questions can go to Randy. He likes the tough ones. So you got something tough, start it off with, hey, Randy, I'd like to ask you a question. So here's, a, here's our charter and our core values. Uh, as you can see, uh, we're just, it's just a forum of executive leaders in our group called PEG, keep, keep in mind of that, PEG. And this is what we do. Uh, we have some core values. We want to make sure we talk about ethics and safety and sustainability, collaboration. But what I said again, collaboration is all about learning about the industry. I learned more about IMO 2020 this week than any human being should know. It, but it's good because that starts in January and. No one's talked to me about it yet. So those are the types of things that we do. 
And at the very bottom of the page, you can see our cute little, we have a really neat little website down there, peg.eci.org. Go on there and you can see some uh, presentations that we've done, some of the things that we're working on. So PEG membership, 13 of the 16 PEG membership companies are CIA members. And most everybody in the room understands what CIA is for. The e and rankings for the top 10 firms are PEG. Uh, I, I got looking, that changes year to year. So we have some folks, um, members that are represented by some, some pretty uh, heavy firms. And when, when you see the list, everybody here is going to go, I know, I do work with them. And I, probably everybody out here does some kind of work with, with one of those firms somewhere down the road. So we are represented, and I'll talk a little bit more about new members in, in, a, in a few minutes. So this is the good stuff. Uh, some of us have worked for different companies, as you can see. And I'm, put a hand up how many people out here have worked for one company in their whole life. Well, Two, right? That, that's, that's where we are in the world. Uh, when I went to my third company, my dad thought I was job shopping. I said, well, Dad, you know, I'm, I'm 40. It happens. But I know our parents worked at the same place their whole life, whether they loved it or not. I remember asking my dad, why do you stay there if you don't like it? He goes, ah, it gives me something to complain about, right? That, that's just how we were built. Well, times have changed. So some of these companies, you can see they, they've been taken over and divided up and sent back. And, and some of you all work for some of these companies, and certainly some of us work for these companies. That's just the nature of the world that we're in. It's all about business, and there's plenty of business to go around. This is a really good slide, and I'm not going to ask anyone to read the names. But this is really nice, because in 1965, the year I was born, nobody do the math on how old I am, 54. <coughs> this was how many engineering and construction firms we had, we had that we were working with. It's 400. That's the top 400. Did a lot of business with this. Your parents worked for them. Your grandparents worked for them. May, maybe some of you might have worked for them. I'm not sure. That's 2019. 38 of them left. 38 out of 400. That's pretty, kind of a scary little slide right there, isn't it? Um, that's, that's, that's just who, that's how the nature of the world is going. Some people combine, some went out of business, some went into something else. So we have to adjust, we have to adapt. So companies get bigger, companies get smaller, companies go here, some go here. There's people here from London, there's people here from Dubai, there's people here from Houston, Randy's from Milwaukee. I mean, seriously, we all... Where everybody's from everywhere. These are the companies that are currently in the PEG, in the Procurement Executives Group. These are who's represented, all the way from Bechtel to Zachary Group, alphabetically. Uh, they've gone up. We've had some. We've had a few more. We've had a few less. Uh, every time I go to a meeting, it seems like there's a new member. Some people retire. We, we add companies. So these are the companies who sit down and... Remember, we're not making policy and, and things like that. We're just trying to learn where the industry is going. And we have guest speakers that come in and, and talk to us. Membership requirements. So this is what we'll look for. We're looking for a significant North American operation. Kind of can be a little lenient on that. We're, we're, we're thinking of going international, the way the world's going. And as you can see, we want a senior management rep. We need 1,000 people in the company somewhere. We're trying, to, we're trying to stay away from, you know, Kent having his own company of six people over here, jumping in the peg and trying to get state secrets. So it's all about pushing the procurement profession going forward. Remember, EPC, we're the P. Okay, so we're a big part of this. And continuing membership, as you can see, uh, we have semi-annual meetings. Uh, we usually have one in the Woodlands, and we usually have one in Arizona. The, uh, my boss always used to go to the Arizona one. I'm not sure why, and I used to go to the Woodlands. Um, just am, right? So in a minute, Carl's going to come up, Carl Newton from Wood, and he's going to talk about renewables. Just, just try to remember as you're, as you're sitting here that if you have questions about the PEG, if you have questions about what we do, Come talk to us afterwards. Uh, we'll, we're always looking for companies to add to the peg. Uh, we're looking for fresh ideas. 
looking for people to add to our group. And I, I want to leave you with one thing that nobody knows I was going to talk about. I look out here and I see a lot of people my age. A lot of people who are in their 50s and the 60s. We have a lot of millennials that are taking place in the workplace. The 25 to 35 or the 22 to 35, depends on where you want to put them. These young kids are really smart. They're not afraid to ask why. Just got to mold them a little bit. Don't be afraid of them. We've been hiring more and more at our company, and I'm learning a lot. really am. So don't be afraid to get youth. Just remember, some, somewhere down the line, somebody who you thought was old grabbed you and helped you. And if they didn't help you, remember those lessons and know not to pass them on. But uh, look forward to your questions. And without further ado, Carl Newton. So I'm going to do a little market update on renewables. I know here in Houston, that's not really a, a popular topic, but um, energy transition is real and it's unstoppable. Um, it's, it's a huge market and it's a growing market. When we look at the unstoppable momentum, all the, most of the major automotive companies are now working on a transition away from combustion as fuel to batteries, uh, to electric vehicles. Um, We've got countries that are now mandating that by 2030, I think in, the, in Norway or Finland, they're going to outlaw combustion engines completely. Uh, Amsterdam as a city by 2030, no more combustion engines. So this is real and it's coming fast. When you look at the overall market for renewables, even with a headwind of, of tariffs and import restrictions, renewables are still the cheapest delivered energy in the, in the world right now. You see coal is subsidized and it's falling off quickly and renewables continue to climb. You've got states that have mandated not only a portfolio percentage but 100% renewables by certain dates and that's anywhere from 2030 to 2050. And I know I've spent most of my life in Colorado, and about 15 years ago, they mandated that they were going to have 10% renewable energy um, within 10 years. They blew by that in five years and were at 20%. And everybody worried initially that they were going to be able to hit the 10. So it, it is moving. Um, right now, we've got about 90 gigawatts of installed solar. Texas is one of the biggest states for solar, or for uh, wind, I'm sorry. Texas is one of the biggest states for wind. Uh, it's a massive piece of the, of the energy portfolio. Um, and solar is starting to catch up. The next big wave is going to be energy storage. Uh, the battery technologies are starting to catch up. You're starting to see... Um, Liquid, or liquid energy storage and some other technologies starting to come to the fore. And you're seeing states that are mandating energy storage requirements now. So before, you know, if you've got solar, it only, it only produces when the sun shines. When you've got wind, the wind's got to blow. If you have energy storage, you can take up that shoulder power in the peak time. And the prices of, of these technologies continue to decline rapidly. So this slide's just an illustration of what the capacity additions in the U.S. are going to be for wind and solar. And if you look as we start to move out, it, it's massive. These, these numbers on, on the left axis are gigawatts. So, and, and these are additions per year. So it, it's, these projects are coming hard and fast, and it's, it's a big, big market. If you look at the benchmarks for the, the CapEx for these plants, you just notice the trend. It's, it started out a few years ago that a solar module itself was about a dollar a watt. We're building plants, entire plants, for less than a dollar a watt now. So it, it continues to drop. Wind continues. It's leveling out. It's it's getting to be a fairly mature technology, um, but the plants, do, the, the individual turbines tend to get bigger. Uh, 
10 years ago, a megawatt and a half was about as big as you saw. They're hitting more than 10 megawatts now for onshore wind. That used to be just the offshore technology. And that's a big piece for you guys in here. I don't know if you've seen somebody move a 10 megawatt wind turbine, but it's got some big, big pieces. And I know you guys want to kind of pull this back into what this means in the transportation and logistics business. The average utility scale solar plant has between 400 and 600,000 modules. And th those are panels. So you're talking about 450 containers per plant for just the solar modules and about 125 truckloads of structural steel. So these plants are really simple. They, they go up fast, but they're very, very supply chain dependent. If you miss by a minute a module, you've lost your money on your plant. So material has to be at the feet of the workers immediately. Um, so the logistics side of it is extremely important. Um, and if you can do the math real quick, based on those gigawatts in the next two year, or next four years, you're talking about 200 of those utility scale solar plants. So it, it's it will be a big piece of everybody's portfolio. And if, if the companies you work with aren't talking about energy transition right now, they will be very soon. And again, the wind turbines just continue to get bigger and bigger all the time. And now Randy's going to talk about some demand. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carl. So uh, I know this group really wants to hear about all the new projects that are out there, new projects that you can do project logistics on and break bulk logistics on. And I'm not going to talk specifically about new projects, but I am going to talk about the demand side for much of what the EPCs do and where those new projects, you know, what the demand, what those new projects are going to be coming from, what, what are the sources of the demand in those markets so you can uh, at least be a little bit ahead of the game chasing the right types of uh, projects in the future. But first, Cove Point LNG Export Terminal in Lesby, Maryland, the G3 Grain Terminal in Vancouver, Canada, the IPL Propane Dehydrogenization Plant in uh, Alberta, and the GCGV Plastics Plant in Gregory, Texas. What do these LNG, grain, propylene, and plastics plants all have in common? Well, they're all large projects executed here in North America, and they're all driven by demand from the global middle class. By the way, I do have some blank transition slides here, so if the PowerPoint goes, goes black, uh, don't panic. So in the U.S., the middle class has been the population majority over the last 40 years, but it reached a global tipping point four years ago when it ceased to be the majority. And if that's the trend here in the U.S., what's happening elsewhere in the world? Well, the opposite is taking place. Instead of shrinking, the global middle class is growing. Global middle class means a four-person household with an annual income of between sixteen dollars and $160,000. Simply put, this consumer class is neither rich nor poor. They're reasonably secure from falling back into poverty, but they're not rich enough to buy everything they might want. The global middle class is growing more rapidly than expected less than a decade ago. Last year, we reached the global tipping point where the majority of the world's population, for the first time ever, live in either middle class or rich households. We're now in a new era of the middle class majority. So what does this mean for the EPCs? Well, I'll get to that. First things first, where is this rapid growth coming from? The largest growth is coming from Asia as hundreds of millions of Chinese and Indian citizens move out of poverty. 140 million people are joining the middle class every year, and in five, year, the five years, this number could rise to 170 million people per year. Now, China and India account for 20 and 29 percent of the global growth, and that total number of people entering the middle class every year is equal to more than half of the population of the U.S. today. By 2030, Asia could represent two-thirds of the global middle class population. 
And these are very interesting statistics, but why do the EPCs really care about this projection? Well, today the global middle class is spending $35 trillion annually, and by 2030 could spend an additional $29 trillion more, growing annual spend to $64 trillion. That's equal to one-third of the global economy. These new consumers are buying motorcycles, cars, refrigerators, taking vacations. They can weather through unexpected events like illness and unemployment. Improved quality of life and increasing global population will result in higher carbon emissions and more demand for power, food, and infrastructure. Increased carbon emissions and growing urban populations will lead to an increased need for smart cities where we take charge of our urban environments through technology. Smart cities that tap into the power of the Internet of Things impact everything from infrastructure to social connections, safety, and security. So Kansas City, where my family and I now live, currently has 54 smart city blocks and was considered the world's most connected smart city in 2016. Twelve of the top 50 smart cities in the world are in the USA, and with 50 additional blocks planned for Kansas City alone, this trend continues to rise. So EPCs are venturing into smart city-related projects where they're gaining valuable experience in preparing ourselves for more opportunities within our growing urban spaces. What do Bill Gates, Richard Branson, Jack Welch, and North America's two largest meat producers have in common? Other than enormous net worth, they're all investors in Memphis Meats a company that produces lab-grown beef and chicken called Clean Meat. This is one example of innovation driven by the quest to address an increasing demand for protein. Food shortages, the need to reduce individual and corporate carbon footprints and alternative power will result in new projects for the EPCs. Looking at the global middle class gives us an insight into what changes across the world will mean for us the global markets will be forced to respond to this powerful new consumer class. By now it should be apparent that adding two billion people to the global middle class will result in some major changes and opportunities. And food is and will continue to be part of the global conversation. Dr. Vikram Manshamani, a lecturer at Harvard and global trend watcher, recently shared a compelling example of the impact of global middle class demand. To keep things simple, Let's think about food in terms of grain. Protein production requires grain and water that could otherwise be directly consumed by people. Converting grain to protein results in a ratio of 2 to 1 for chicken, 4 to 1 for pork, and 8 to 1 for beef. Now let's consider a family of four sitting down to dinner in India. Typically, each person consumes a sim single bowl of rice for a total of four bowls but this family has improved their lot in life, shifted into the middle class, and now they can afford to add more protein to their diet. So one evening they decide to add chicken to their rice. Accounting for the conversion, this family is now consuming the equivalent of 12 bowls of rice. Maybe they'd rather have pork. And with a four to one ratio, they're now up to 20 bowls. And if this family of four opts for beef for dinner, that's equal to 36 bowls. Other than a lot of hypothetical bowls to wash, what does this example really tell us? Dramatic increases in protein demand means more grain production that requires fertilizer, water, and fertile land. Additional and upgraded infrastructure will also be required to meet these new demands. So just think about how many new projects like G3 Terminal Vancouver and Cove Point LNG will be needed to increase, needed to support these increases in food handling and energy necessary to meet the world's changing appetite, not to mention the impact on the water supply. The example of this family's dinner is happening across the globe at an accelerated pace. We're already seeing changes in the global food system due to shifting economies, demographics, and health. The future of food impacts us all, but we're definite optimists here at the EPCs and see these global changes as opportunities. The demands of the global middle class will lead to new projects that may or, not, may or may not be right for us. What is certain is that we must be aware of what is taking place around us. 
We must understand how demand influences rapid market changes and continue to respond, ensuring we're part of the global conversation. We're already evolving our businesses and our engineering capabilities continue to grow, allowing us to provide a full a project delivery model to clients, which usually involves uh, global engineering centers, high value global engineering centers. And our procurement businesses keep us connected to the global supply chain. So being a global company doesn't necessarily mean that we're building work all over the planet. We're already connected to the global community through our markets. It's clear the demand trends we're seeing now are going to have major implications for the EPCs as the world continues to evolve more quickly than ever before in history. Thank you. Okay, so uh, glad you're all here today. I got the uh, straw of delivering some economic news and some market intelligence and, uh, and some statistics right before lunch. So uh, I'll try to keep everybody interested in what we're going to walk through. But one of the biggest advantages that I think of being in the PEG organization is the collaborative uh, effort with IHS market. And um, so IHS has been around a while. I've known them for quite a while. But their capability has grown really substantially over the years. And um, so I'm going to go through some of the metrics that uh, they're looking at today and talk through those. Um, probably, the, to me, the biggest power of all this is that you know, when I first started in supply chain, you could go get some commodity data and try to get a glimpse into where things were at and where things might be going. Um, it was a little harder to get, say, finish some of the finished goods and equipment material perspectives and things that, that we can get to today. So there's just a lot more channels for this information today, and I think it positions us very, very well as, as buyers to be a lot smarter about what we're doing. Um, and what IHS has done is they've collaborated with PEG in some regards for one of these that you'll see, but, but also with the Institute of Supply Management and other parties. So you really end up with multiple data points that can kind of help together guide, guide you into your uh, decisions that will be either, you know, opportunities for tomorrow or in risk mitigation tomorrow. So that's the idea. And, um, you know, so last week, if anybody paid attention, it was a very volatile week in the markets. We got a look at employment, wages, job growth, factory numbers in the U.S., fa uh, factory a little, little bit globally as well. We got insight into that. The ISM released their purchasing managers index for manufacturing. And then later in the week, they came out with their non-manufacturing or service-oriented GMI. Um, so a lot of things going on right now. And uh, in fact, you know, a lot of what we have here uh, depends a lot on the trade uncertainty, the trade measures that are in place, and what's going to happen there. And there's some very important meetings this week uh, with the United States and China, and so the markets are watching that very closely too as the week uh, comes to a close. So we'll see where some of this goes from there. Um, so when you look at the headline, global economy, you know, what we know coming out of all that is, yeah, there's heightened risk, and we're probably going to see some more stimulus as things move forward. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more on a future slide around that. There is a couple pieces of really good news in this, I think. You know, right now, currently, IHS market is not forecasting a recession. Um, demand is slow, and this, but you'll see primarily that softness is in the manufacturing sector. Um, back in 2009, you know, we're kind of seeing similar numbers, but when you look at it, the U.S. was a lot less dependent on uh, services and more on manufacturing back then, and now it's kind of begun to flip or we've kind of got a different thing going. And so um, right now, IHS market is not forecasting recession. I think what you'll see as I move through this, though, is the discussion around recession. The margin of error has gotten smaller and smaller. So definitely heightened risk. Um, and the other good news is if you're a buyer, it's, you'll find in some of these slides I'm getting ready for to show you that you know the, the producers have very little leverage right now. It's a, generally speaking, it's a buyer's market. If you have investment, if you have requirements, now's the time to buy with strength. And I'll show you that a little bit later. So in the U.S., we've got some numbers down in the manufacturing area last week, as I talked about. You know, there's uh, some measures being put in place, some interest rate cuts being considered further. 
and, uh, and some additional fiscal stimulus. Hopefully that'll be enough as the U.S. takes measures to prop our own economy up for the, for the near term. But globally, the message is uh, a lot more uncertainty. Global environment is very volatile right now. And as we look out, the farther we look out, the more uncertain. All right, so one, one way we measure global growth and look at global growth is GDP, gross domestic product. And what you see here um, is really a percent change GDP for the world, the global GDP on line one, and then a lot of the G20 countries down the left side, and year over year uh, percent changes. Now, you know how we know e economists have a sense of humor, right? They use a lot of decimal points. So uh, this chart is full decimal points. It's you know incremental in some ways. But what you'll notice is 2019, every one of those items is lower than 2018 was. And we start to see in 2020 a little bit more of a mixed bag as I reviewed this chart, uh, with some of, the, some of the countries actually getting a little bit growth. But there are certain places that, we're, that the economists are looking very closely at, the UK, Japan, uh, the Eurozone, those are very important um, uh, parts of the world right now that um, a lot is hinging on trade as well. I mean, the Eurozone impact is heavy in Germany, and uh, their exports are down big time as they're big trading partners with China, so you know, this has ramifications for everyone. The, um, I was trying to remember, uh, the OECD came out, I think it was last week or the week before, too, and they estimated something. They said, well, you know, if, if, if the trade measures don't get some, some kind of a resolution, they see a 0.3 to 0.4 percentage decrease in next year in GDP, global GDP. And then in 2021, um, a 0 .2, 0 .2, 0.2 to 0.3 percentage points. So in dollars, Bank of America estimated it at $700 billion by the end of 2021. So this, this is... Uh, you know, a big component of what they're looking at from GDP standpoint, for sure. Okay, so this is the International Purchasing Managers Index. And I don't want to get too confused because there's multiple parties that issue these PMIs, okay, Pur Purchasing Manager Index. And ISM, the Institute of Supply Management, will usually issue a manufacturing one and a non-manufacturing one, just like I talked about a minute ago. This is a uh, composite index with some collaboration between J.P. Morgan, IHS Market, ISM, and IFSM, IFTSM, excuse me, um, that they do together to really give us a more global perspective. And, you know, I don't know how many people, you know, have interest or follow these kinds of things, but this is really a good index, confidence index, so to be familiar with and something to look at on a more regular basis to kind of keep your mind around the global business. It's also used as a leading indicator that where they start seeing the turning of business cycles. So I like, I like this one. Um, what you'll see is on these PMIs is anything over 50 reflects growth. Anything under 50 is contraction. So in 2018, all these dots were green, almost all of them, I'd say. Um, I think with the U.S. release last week, probably it's red now. Uh, I think it went to 49.7, so it's more in the contraction area. And this is, again, global manufacturing, not including the services sector. Um, so you'll see the Eurozone and some of the things I talked about a second ago, and some of the steep drop-offs there. Um, but um, over half, I'd say probably over half of the 30 that they follow um, is in the red right now. So definitely a global slowdown, starting to trickle down. There's job losses in Europe, I was reading just the other day. Um, so this is starting to have a more lingering effect uh, for all of us, I think. Okay, so within those PMIs, you can break it down further to, to some subcomponents. This is delivery and backlogs. And the idea here is to get a sense for, you know, are we in a buyer's market or a seller's market? So just to quickly try to explain this chart, on the left side is the backlogs uh, scale. On the right side is the deliveries, and it's inverted, so it's going down. And 
the gray area, the gray line is the backlog line, the dark line is the delivery timeline. So what you see, if you just do a quick look, you know, we're in a three year low right now um, for both these things. And you really have to go back to 2012 to see very similar uh, position of both of these uh, PMIs. So, you know, most of the time a slow market is faster deliveries. I think the longer this thing hangs out here, you're probably going to see more profound effects on pricing and, and capacity. So right now is, is the right time, generally speaking, to be a buyer in the market. Um, and that's really the message here. And this is a good breakdown of something to uh, watch you know, as we go forward, too, because this can change very, very quickly. Uh, all it takes sometimes is some of the shocks in the economy that you didn't see coming. And this thing just can do a quick reverse. Um, so that is the buyer's market. I want to move in real quickly to some of the key commodities. And this is the one I was talking referring to earlier. This is the PEG and IHS uh, collaboration. So what you're looking at, if I can see it on here, the green line is the current headline index, and the gray line across the chart is the six month look ahead. So what they're doing is they're through the EPC firms, they're getting a look into, you know, what's going on? Where's the investments now? You know, how, what are these things in these market baskets of material and equipment and in the subcontract labor? That, uh, how are those going individually? You know, is it, where are you at today? Is it higher than last month, lower than last month? And then six months from now, do you expect it to be higher, lower, same, whatever? And what you're seeing then is a composite of both of those together on the left side for current state and six months from now. Now, you know, this, this is kind of looked at the same way. It's, it's a really good co confidence index. Kind of look at it, see the turning points in the business cycles. Investments are starting to happen. EPCs will, you know, that'll be the feedback they'll be getting. I also think, because you can look at this and say, well, that seems like maybe it's in conflict with the GDP and some of the other data you just showed me. I would also add that, you know, I'm a supply, pay, supply chain manager, so I can say this, but, you know, we're probably more risk averse. So when you're asking me what prices are going to be, I'm thinking prices are going to be a little higher, uh, just, just naturally. But that's my, that's my goal is to, you know, get out and make sure I understand that. And, and usually I'm anticipating higher costs. So that would just be the nature, I think, of some of the pe people responding as well. But it is a, this is a very important uh, metric being recognized by many trade associations now, and it's association between IHS and, and the PEG group here. So um, you will notice a couple of ocean freight components in the material and equipment section as well. Um, and I would say, you know, overall, they showed this last slide, this was probably August data if I'm looking at it, and both materials and equipment and subcontract labor expectations were higher. But, the, but these numbers you're seeing are composite, so really, you know, in all, it, when you, just to make sure it's clear, um, you know, carbon pipe was down last month, so, and copper was more flat, so there, there are the exceptions within these market baskets, but not all of them. Okay, this is uh, hot rolled steel sheet prices, and uh, right now the world is a lot of overproduction. Many of the mills had said they were going to cut production for quite some time now, but there's, the evidence just isn't showing up yet. Still very much perceived uh, oversupply. And orders are down everywhere. So um, those two things together are you know, a bad mix. So what you're really seeing in 2020 and 21 is flat and maybe even lower for steel. Um, you know, I think I IHS is it's kind of making the assumption here in 2020 that you know eventually all these the production cuts will happen and that'll allow recovery sometime during 2020 and then you might see some uh, reaction to that from a price standpoint. Um, I know at our company we, we just haven't seen a forecast yet for steel going up so it's at least a little bit out. On the base metal side of things it's kind of much the same story downgrades the demand um, Price corrections, lower outlooks for most of base metals. What they're showing here is copper on the left and nickel on the right. This is relatively normal fluctuation on the copper side of things. Um, but on the nickel side, you know, this is where this year, if you look at where the 
dotted line went up in 2019, a significant price increase. Um, that's probably the one base metal that's uh, unique here in 2019. But even then, it'll level out during 2020 and 21, fairly stable. Um, most of that, we believe, was due to the, the uh, restrictions on mining in Indonesia and maybe some closure of some mills. So. Okay, and then on the transportation side of things, so everybody knows about IMO 2020 in this group probably. Probably know a lot more than I do about it. Um, certainly on the deep sea freight side of things, price has been going up for quite some time when you look at the chart, I believe the chart there. You know, there was some uh, demand drop in early 2019, I think, and really all that is is a small flattening of the line upwards, it looks like to me. Um, looking ahead, though, certainly they're saying the you know sharp increase in fuel costs from IMO 2020, uh, as well as the capacity kind of getting back into a spot that'll uh, provide some price support as well. So that they're looking for uh, five percent by the end of 2019, and a three and a half percent increase in 2020. People you talk to says it's going to spike and then probably grow at a more gradual, gradual um, line after that. So on trucking, you know, this chart is the producer price index, I think, for trucking. And huge curve up in 2018. I mean, think about what you had. You had high imports, there was expansion everywhere, manufacturing, construction, there's a lot going on, tight labor market. And then in 2019, all three of those things kind of cooled off, right? So you had this steep line back down. Um, going forward, I think the two, they put in here the two things that they think can provide some bottom-up support on prices is the tight labor conditions are still continuing with to support some wage growth for truck drivers. And the diesel prices will be affected by the IMO 2020 with the shifting demand patterns. And you, know, you can look at the chart at the bottom. That is the demand side of the trucking uh, illustration here. And all three, all four, construction, logging, mining, and industrial production, down demand for drivers. Uh, going forward through 2020. And then uh, on the rail side of things, uh, also demand's been cooling on the rail. Uh, you know, coal, the coal market's been declining for a number of years, so um, that's expected to continue. There's lower trade volumes and imports. Uh, the rail car supply creeping higher, although they've most of the new orders are replacement, not expansion. Um, so when you've got, look at those two charts down there, you've got, you got a supply and a demand that's fairly stable over the next couple, three years. Then you look to what's, you know, what's going to drive any price growth, and it's, it's the primary cost of labor, equipment, and fuel. So with that, IHS is expected to, uh, expecting this to grow 3.2% in 2019 and 3% in 2020. Question anybody has. Uh, we're not experts in a lot of things. We're, we're just good enough in some things to fake it or, or give you an answer what we think it is. <laughs> so uh, wide open, anything you have. Uh, it's, your, it's, your, it's your day. Over there. He's going to bring you the microphone. <coughs> mm. Hello. Uh, so some people think that uh, renewable energy um, of solar and wind is uh, has limitations and um, isn't going to be <coughs> the future. And there's a lot of people speculating that nuclear fusion is going to be the future of renewable energy and that wind and solar will be obsolete within the next 15, 20 years. Um, my question to you, especially for the EPCs, is what does – have you guys heard about that in the market and what would that footprint look for a nuclear fusion um, facility? So I'll take that. Uh, the small scale nuke is real, and there is technology behind it. Uh, I mean, obviously, Bill Gates has started a company that's specifically to do that. The problem with nuke in the U.S. right now is that it's really, really unpopular politically. Um, it's going to take a while for it to get momentum. I, I would hate to say it doesn't have a future because it's it's. Uh, it is clean power, and with the, the newer technologies where they're using spent uranium cake instead of um, 
the active rods, it's a, it's a much cleaner, safer setup. But I, I would have to say that renewables are, are around and they're going to be around. They're, they will be part of the energy portfolio. Um, it, it, there's just too much of it and too much momentum right now to not. Um, you know, when you look at it as a balanced portfolio, there really is a, a need for, for multiple types of power. That there's always going to be some combustion power. There's going to need to be renewables, and there will be some space for new. Um, I don't think there's a single magic bullet. And part of it's resource constraints to different areas of the world. So there, there has to be a little bit of all of it. I don't know if that answer. Good, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I have a question for you four guys. And uh, you know, today, this, now we are in the innovation era. So my question for you is how the innovation uh, like uh, big data or AI, how you, uh, your company uh, implant this kind of uh, innovation into your supply chain management, please. Thank you. Hey, grab. You want to take it? Yeah. I'm probably the least innovative person in the whole group here. <clears throat> but I can tell you, uh, I talked about hiring millennials earlier. Uh, I still have to call my kid in Seattle to help me program my TV. But... <clears throat> That, that's where it comes forward. You know, AWP, advanced work packaging, and some things that CII are working on. It, it's all about supply chain. Uh, it don't matter if you build a great product and you need a great product. If you can't get it from point A to point B, if you don't have a truck driver, you don't have some way to get it there, it just doesn't happen. So uh, innovation is big for us, and, and it's kind of a new... In, it's, it's not new, and a lot of us older folks talk innovation, but I just want my computer to come on when I turn it on in the morning. So we have, to, we have to keep growing. We have to come up with new ways. Supply chain is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. We have stuff like advanced work packaging, some, some real fancy words like blockchain. Some of you have heard blockchain come out. And there's probably other acronyms that come out. So we as leaders in our groups and you as people who own companies and run companies, got to keep fostering that. We, we have to get better and better. People want to know where their product is at all times. That's the newest thing. It starts here and it's ending there, but where is it today? Does it have to stay at a certain temperature today? You know, blockchain does a lot of that stuff. Everything's, you know, my email is up in the clouds now, whatever the hell that means, okay? But seriously, and that's what we have to do. We have to keep innovating because you're exactly right. If you don't innovate, you know, you go down. My phone used to be this big on my hip, you know, now it's this big. Um, but that's a real good question. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in innovation here. Yeah, I'll, I'll add in there, too. Uh, you saw the slide that showed the 400 largest EPCs 50 years ago. Now 90% of them are gone. So what you, one of the challenges you see in the industry is so many of the companies, there's been so many mergers and so many acquisitions, they're actually dealing with not one or two systems, but multiple different systems and ERP platforms and systems they're trying to run their business on. And that's a, that's a huge challenge for companies that have not adopted even to one system. So that's another factor that definitely affects this industry. The, the other part about the systems is a lot of companies have offices all over the world. And different parts of the world don't talk to these sides. And, and that's, that's, that's a real good the ERP is just hurting us. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you so much for your excellent uh, uh, comment on the innovation. Consider your contribution for the future innovation into your, your supply chain management. I'm creating xpeg.org. Xpeg, that means you guys sitting on the peg, right? Yes. I'm doing xpeg to welcome you guys to, sit in, to, to come to our platform after your retirement. Thank you so much. <laughs> Even you are so, so young here. Thank you. Question here? Question down there. One over there. This side of the room is beating you guys right now. Mm -hmm. you got to get a question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the slides was mentioned that uh, a solar uh, project requires 450 containers. 
I'm in shipping, I need to get a hold of that. So where would that be coming from? Because containers mean sea freight and I want to go after it. And by 2020, there will be like 120 more solar projects. I want to go after that if you guys don't. China, where is it? Yeah, it's China. It, well, China, Vietnam, Singapore, the, the typical places where you see um, a lot of silicone production, the microchips, okay. it's the same places that solar panels are going to be coming up. Um, but it, it's, um, you know, it, they're, they're, who you need to target are typically the companies that are building because they're, they're responsible for the shipping. So this is this is a question probably uh, for Jay because Jay, your your data, as you pointed out, some of it was in conflict with each from slide to slide. But um, on one hand, uh, showed a buyer's market. The other hand, IHS data showed rising uh, pricing uh, for materials and services. So taking that into mind, where does Peg see? The demand for new project work going. There wasn't. There wasn't. I don't think a projection you put up there for where. Where is the work going to be in the future with regard to either infrastructure, oil and gas, or renewables, or what? what what's Peg expect going forward, and particularly, particularly from an employment perspective in the EPC world, uh, what's that going to look like? What's that line look like? Do you think? So when we do the PEG index every month, it really is focused on prices, commodity prices, costs, labor, materials, engineered equipment, subcontractors, that type of thing. Uh, we don't have a, an in index on new projects, but what I would say is that most of the EPCs that I've talked to and PEG members, they've got very healthy backlogs. Many of the companies right now have all-time record backlogs. I know my company has an all-time record backlog. A lot of bidding activity is out there, and I think it kind of depends a little bit on, you know, what markets are you looking at. So diversification is, is key, I think. Uh, you know, we focus on seven key end markets, oil and gas, power, and transportation infrastructure. Those, I would say, are the big three that we focus on, and they're all very, very healthy. But then also we have the, the water, the wastewater projects. We've got the industrial projects now, which is a more of a new focus industry for us, and it really does get back into that global middle class uh, growth that we're seeing in, in, the, in the need for food and beverage projects in particular, and more manufacturing, especially when you're talking about here in North America and trying to bring, bring back manufacturing. And changes in, in uh, spending habits and even changes with the food and beverages, whether it be malt and barley plants for the, brewer, the brewing industry that's growing or more packaged food, uh, healthy food, frozen food for you know, families. Everyone's working in the family now, so they need more of those type of choices. So we're seeing plants uh, and opportunities uh, to be built here in North America along those lines. And we also have mining projects and we've got vertical building uh, markets. I think that's, that's a seven. And so, this is the first time really we've probably seen in, in many, many years where all seven of those markets are heading up and positive at the same time. Usually with diversification, some markets are up, some markets are down, that's why you diversify. We're seeing all of them trending up right now, so that's a, that's a really good thing for the EPCs and future projects. Electrification, it's going to make for a, a more economical feedstock for the downstream and chemical work, which the, the polymers and things like that, in which this area is obviously one of the world's biggest producers of. So we, we have seen a, a big uptick in uh, the downstream and chemical side of the business. I think the real key is, is the shifting types of projects. Fossil fuel, coal, nuclear, maybe no, you know, not as good, but the renewables, the LNG export terminals, uh, the, the, the gas, and you know, so things are shifting, renewables growing. So you know, same type of thing happening in the industrial markets with this growth in the, in the global middle class.
Gentlemen, question. With the economic uncertainties, uh, political uncertainties that we're dealing with right now in places like, say, the tariffs via the U.S. and China, as well as Brexit, as a couple of examples, how are you able to do your pricing with uh, and explain to your customers? Obviously, these projects are priced years out. How are you explaining to your customers or dealing with the, the fluctuations in prices that are occurring due to this? I, I, can, ask, I can answer that a little bit. Uh, we all, we're all come from different companies, different sizes, different levels. Uh, in my company, we do most of our work in the, in the Gulf Coast area. So we're not so diverse as far as overseas markets and such. So it's a little easier for my side. So, so what we basically do is we try to hedge our bets and get risk adverse. Obviously, the best thing you want to do is take all the risk and put it on your client. But that's what they want to do to us. That's why they have us. So what you got to do is you got to get out and get to the marketplace. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta know what's happening in the market. Where's steel prices heading? Where's pipe heading? You know, what, what are the tariff things doing to you? And you just have to, you have to price it in, and you have to, you have to show your client and be honest with them up front, just what it is you're doing, because they, they know the market too. When, you know, we're not in the aha moment. You know, aha, I got you. It's costing you, but it's really costing everybody. So we try to be honest up front. This peg group. Is, a, is, is really a big thing for myself and my company. We get global, the IHS market, we get, we get an economist who does it for a living. I didn't go to George Washington, I didn't go to Cornell, I'm not an economist, I, you know, we just hear what they say. Like, we know interest rates are going down in December. Buy a house, you wanna, it's going down. We know what the political uncertainty is. 2020 is gonna be political uncertainty. It's coming, we know it. So you try to price some of that risk in. But it's a, it's a fine line, just like you, where you're going is you don't want to price yourself out of the market. You want to price yourself in the market. And trucking is a good example. So I put in, you know, I asked the question the other day. I, this I, IMO 2020 scared the heck out of me. I mean, I was like, so do I put in another 10% that I'm going to cost for trucking in 2020? I asked, I asked some real smart people, do I do it? And they said, well, I, I can't tell you, but... That's what I'm looking at because I know fuel's going up more than normal, not your normal two or three percent. Some of the, the global markets that these guys play in a little bit, it's even a little more risky. You know, what, what's coming across, what's getting tariffed. So you take a percentage of that and you use your, use your brain and you try to figure out what you've seen in the past and that's what you price in and, and you go with it. Sometimes it prices you out, sometimes it doesn't. You know, sometimes every job you don't get, you might be glad we didn't get it. Good night. Does that answer you? Yeah, thank you. So Good, thank you very much. Yeah. Just a little bit to add to that. The, the tariffs are only one component of our price. Our markets are really heavy fabrication and other and, and large equipment. So it, at times our market's more capacity driven than it is really raw material price driven. So uh, I tend to look more at the shop capacities and right now, even with the tariffs, you start to, the prices still haven't had the, as much upward pressure as you would have thought. We saw a blip when the tariffs were originally enact, enacted. Steel went up uh, quite a bit, um, but it dropped right back down. And you can see from the, the, the curves that Jay was showing, they're, they're going to go down even more. But it, we, we tend to look a lot more at capacity in lieu of raw price. I was going to say, that's a really great question. And all the EPCs do have escalation models. I think all the EPCs are doing some hedging. You know, we're all, we're all looking for uh, possibly a contract where we can have a change order for costs that change or go up. We love the cost reimbursable work when we can get it, of course. Uh, so, you know, when we've got healthy backlogs, uh, you know, we should be estimating appropriately. But also what the procurement groups do is, is they diversify their supply chain. So maybe we buy a little bit less from China now, but we buy a little bit more from other countries in Southeast Asia or Mexico. So there's other sources. We, we rely on our global trade compliance folks to understand the classification methods and the HDS codes and whether or not maybe we need a binding ruling on, on products. So we understand exactly what the, what the um, tariff impacts or costs are going to be. We can also use INCO terms to our advantage. We can have suppliers sign, you know, DDP terms and put that risk on our suppliers as well. So there's a lot of different options and things uh, the EPCs can do to help mitigate that risk. Can you hear me? Oh. 
Hello? Hi, I have a question. Uh, my name is Austin Wetz. I work for Summit Industrial. Um, you guys talk a lot about Canada, but I was wondering about our neighbors in our backyard, Mexico. Do you guys have any forecasts for 2020 and doing business with that country? Thanks. Are you, are you meaning supply chain business or projects in Mexico? Well, I know there's a, you know, just doing business in general. Uh, the most news I've seen was 2016 uh, from the three wood, fluor, and um, kiwit. So I was just wondering how the outlook looks doing business with those guys and building trust with them right here in our backyard. So from the GDP slides, you know, the, the economy projection for Mexico was not particularly great, but I think Mexico is a country that has a huge amount of need for infrastructure and energy. By some est estimations, we believe they need more power plants in Mexico, new build than even in the United States. So it's a, it's a big economy. I, I think the, the population's around 90 million people and, and growing. Uh, so it, it's a great opportunity. We're, we're down into Mexico in, in a big way. A high value engineering center in Mexico as well. We're looking at the markets there in oil and gas and in power. Uh, primarily, and, and we see it as, as a good market, although the, the, the economic indicators in, in Canada, or I'm sorry, in Mexico are not particularly great. There's not a lot of economies right now that are much better than, than the outlook here in the United States. And just to, to add a little bit to Mexico, um, you know, obviously Pemex has loosened its hold on that oil and gas market in Mexico and starting to allow um, more of the mega majors to come in. So we've seen an uptick in inquiries from Mexico um, and even their own infrastructure. Pemex has started to uh, really push refinery upgrades and, uh, and actually looking at some new greenfield grassroots refineries. So we, we do see that there's going to be a pickup in the oil and gas business um, in the next few years. It's, it's obviously early. Um, you know, a lot of those big companies were pushed out at one point, and they're, so they're somewhat hesitant to jump in, you know, with both feet. But they are starting to move in. That, that's really a great point. Yeah, when the Constitution of Mexico changed a couple of years ago, allowing foreign investment into their energy, their oil and gas, and their power, and it's no longer just Pemex and no longer just CFE for power. The foreign developers and owners have come down there, and they're trying to develop projects. One of our Recent project wins in Mexico was for a Canadian company that's building uh, oil and gas work in Mexico. So I think that that's a huge uh, fa positive factor. And uh, just to talk to SMB, uh, you guys have a heavy pre presence in the Gulf. Would you all ever consider doing work in Mexico? Uh, we always consider work almost anywhere. We, we are primarily uh, U.S. Gulf Coast. We've done probably probably 50 or 60 small projects in the U.S. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we do not go across the pond or up to Canada or down in Mexico. Uh, we, 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 we're, we're U.S. based and uh, the biggest difference for us is uh, we subcontract very little. We direct hire all our labor. So uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we have labor forces all across the Gulf Coast and that model doesn't lend itself to other places. Uh, we're not going to be competitive across the pond or even in China with our own labor going there. So that, that right now, I would say <clears throat> no, but uh, we do have a uh, small project we're looking at doing in South America right now that we're, we're streamlining and we're, we're smiling about trying to, trying to get it under wraps. So be before we wrap up, I'd like a question for you guys, um, just a show of hands. Of the, for the shippers in the room, how many of you have a plan articulated for the IMO 2020? Is it, does anybody it. see it as a problem? I mean, is it? I, I, I worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I know. I know. Um, like I said, I learned a lot about IMO last week. IMO 2020. I'm, I, I was home spouting it off and. I know my wife went to sleep talking to her about it, but uh, you know it's going to cost you guys money too because that demand for that product is going to go to the container side, and I, I'm I'm really con I'm concerned about what it's going to be for our trucking side and our local because as I told you we we do everything in the state so that demand could be pulled back. We all got to chip in and, and we we got to make it right and try to do the right thing for the 
you know, for, for everything that goes on. So in the environment, obviously, is a big part of that. And we, we all learned a lot last week. We did have the procurement executive group fall meeting last week in, in the Woodlands, and we had representatives from the ECMC present on a variety of topics like the IMO 2020. And, you know, one of the other things I kind of wanted to add in, since the, the PEG did get its 25th anniversary as an organization uh, earlier, earlier this year, you know, they've continued that tradition of uh, meeting in the spring in, in uh, Arizona and meeting in, here in the Houston area or the Woodlands area every fall. So for 25 years, that tradition and those venues and those locations um, have, have continued in those meetings are always, uh, we, we, we learn an awful lot uh, from each other as well as the speakers we bring in. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.